Next speaker comes from Cornell University, which is not too far from New York. Very famous for two things. One of the best restaurants in the world called Mousewood, and of course the speaker, Maureen Hansen, who's with us today, but the restaurant's closed this afternoon, so we'll have to forget that. Maureen. Thank you. Well, actually, Cornell is in New York, but it's New York State, although we have a portion of Cornell that is in New York City, which is our uh, medical school. It's a four-hour bus ride between our medical school and where I am in Ithaca, New York, and we run a bus three times a day so that we can communicate with our colleagues uh, easily in, uh, in New York City. So we've been going to be talking a lot about biomarkers, and I thought it might be useful to put up a definition of uh, biomarker uh, here. Uh, biomarker is actually a contraction of the word two words biological marker. We often do this in English. And the, uh, it's a characteristic that's objectively measured, and that's why it's important. It's completely objective and it's not something that has to be measured by a questionnaire so that uh, it, it's believable by people who have doubts about uh, individuals who self-report uh, their symptoms as often occurs in MECFS. So, so why are these biomarkers needed? I just touched on this. Uh, one of them, though, is that we need a diagnostic test to distinguish between MECFS and other fatiguing illnesses. If we had this, it would be much easier to have development of drugs, to have uh, d uh, physicians believe that there's a real biological illness going on. Uh, we also need objective measures for the effect of interventions and drug therapies. One of the problems, I believe, with, for example, the Amplogen study is we don't have good objective measures uh, that have been to be used uh, to prove that a drug is efficacious. Uh, and, and we absolutely need that uh, kind of uh, marker in order to uh, make some progress on drug treatments. We also need it for selection of participants for studies of MECFS. is is not uh, unknown to everyone here. If you select uh, people who have depression, for example, to participate in your study, you will get a different outcome than if you have genuine uh, individuals with MECFS. And then finally, we really need this, we need biomarkers that, to give us information to be used to identify the underlying cause or causes of MECFS or its major symptoms. Uh, I think that we don't know whether there is a single cause or multiple causes of, of uh, the disease. And until we have more information about the underlying cause or causes, we will not know uh, whether it is as complex as some people think, or whether there actually may be a fairly simple answer. So we actually do have some biomarkers in MECFS, and I just wanted to mention this, is that there's pretty good evidence that's been around for quite a long time that there's some sort of abnormal immune cell function. Uh, if I look at what's been repeated by multiple labs, one of them is the altered nat natural killer cell activity. It's also been repeated by different labs that there are um, objective physiological measures that differ in two-day cardiopulmonary exercise tests, and I talked about that in an earlier uh, conference here. I also think there's evidence from multiple laboratories about abnormalities in brain imaging, and we'll be hearing more about some of those later on. There have been some more recent studies, of course. Uh, uh, Mady Hornig mentioned the uh, change in the cytokine levels there's been gene expression, autoantibodies, hormone levels. These all are very promising but need to be replicated in multiple labs and may give us some real leads to what's happening. So what I'm actually going to do today is talk about our effort to find bio biomarkers from the bacterial microbiome in MECFS. This, was, this work was funded uh, in part uh, by Cornell and also in part by uh, NIAID, NIH, uh, two-year a grant to study the bacterial microbiome. I have a uh, collaborator, uh, lab, collaborating lab, Ruth Lay, uh, is a very well-known uh, microbiome expert at Cornell, and her lab and my lab worked together to do this study. Our, our participating physician was Susan Levine, who is located in Manhattan, New York, 
and uh, she provided us this, uh, identified the patients and provided us uh, with uh, samples. So the, the human microbiota uh, is, uh, has as many, micro there are many microbial cells as human cells. There, uh, it used to be thought there were 10 times as many microbial cells, but actually re looking again at the data, it appears it's only about the same number. The majority of these are in the large intestine, although as Mady mentioned, they're uh, in other places as well. And they do provide enhanced nutrition and protection against pathogens, so the microbiota are obviously quite important. Uh, there's been a, a resurgence of interest in uh, the microbiota, and this is uh, indicated by this recent cover of the Science Journal. Uh, I, I, it was an amazing artist's uh, uh, drawing here to, to draw the different uh, parts of the digestive system. Now, what we want to know is where these bad little red guys are more prevalent than the good uh, blue guys uh, in, when we're doing these microbiome analyses. So we do know that microbiomes can be associated with disease. These are just so, some titles of papers that have been published in major journals. We know that gut microbes are associated with obesity. Uh, this is one a paper that uh, Ruth Lay did when she was a postdoc before she became an assistant professor. Uh, we know it's associated with type 2 diabetes. And also, uh, it looks uh, like uh, there are a number of papers now showing that Crohn's disease uh, patients have abnormal uh, microbiota in their uh, intestine. The question, though, is sometimes whether these abnormalities are a cause or a consequence of the uh, disease with which they're correlated. Now, there are a number of different factors that are associated with gut microbiota co uh, composition. Whether, for example, you're a vegetarian or whether you might uh, like these sausages that I photographed in Poland, also, of course, your health status, whether you are in good health or whether you're someone who has ME-CFS. Your genotype also makes a difference. Um, as uh, was mentioned earlier, there's a, a particular gene uh, that's abnormal in some people with Crohn's disease that, that makes them more likely to have uh, that, uh, that problem. And then finally, your age can also affect your, your microbiota. So many MECFS patients complain of gastrointestinal symptoms. So the hypothesis then, the questions we want to ask are, does infl inflammation exist possibly due to some abnormal gastrointestinal function? And do the bacterial gut microbiomes of MECFS patients differ from healthy controls? So the population that we used uh, was, was, as I mentioned, from Susan Levine. We had 30 uh, female and 9 male controls. We had patients, 38 female and 11 male, and of these, there were 25 sudden onset. We tried to match as well as we could in age and also in body mass index, so the people were approximately uh, the, uh, the same size with regard to BMI. We did survey the people who participated for what we called intestinal discomfort. This could be any problem, stomach aches, uh, diarrhea, uh, constipation. If they thought they had intestinal di discomfort, we uh, recorded that on some forms. And it is true that a lot of healthy people do occasionally have issues with their intestine. And we did have some uh, in this study who, uh, among the controls who did have some complaints. Uh, as I'm sure many of you who are here who are patients know, the SF36 questionnaire is often used to characterize MECFS patients, and that was one of the questionnaires that we used. When uh, we compare our study population to others that have been reported, uh, our, they're very similar. Our study population is very similar to those used in prior studies. So our study is the black bar here, and the scores are very comparable between our study and many of these other uh, studies. Now, um, as, as you heard about in the previous talks, there, there is this uh, uh, molecule called lipopolysaccharide. Uh, lipopolysaccharides are molecules that are present on certain kinds of bacteria, so-called gram-negative bacteria, their cell wall 
can be decorated with these lipopolysaccharides, as, as shown here. So uh, it, the lipopolysaccharide can potentially be a uh, marker um, that, uh, of, of inflammation if it gets into the bloodstream. Uh, it, it's known to be elevated in Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, and it's a marker of intestinal permeability. There's a protein uh, called LBP, which is LPS binding protein. This binds LPS to form a complex, and that complex can then go be interacted with by a receptor. The a receptor is called S-soluble CD14, and that detects, that's how the body detects the presence of LPS. There's also another protein called FABP that's a marker of intestinal damage in some studies. So we decided we would like to assay all uh, these four um, markers in the blood to see if they might be different in our two cohorts. If, if the bacteria have escaped from a dysfunctional gut, then the LPS could be out there uh, being detected and causing inflammation. So this, uh, this is our, some of our data uh, in which we assayed for L LPS and FABP. Now, each one of these little dots represents the value for a different subject. Uh, this is the amount of LPS on the y-axis, and we have controls versus CFS, controls versus ME-CFS. You can see in this case that there isn't really much difference, be difference between the controls and the ME-CFS. But here, if you look at this line showing you the average amount, the median, the, uh, you'll see that the ME-CFS have a higher amount, and this is statistically significant. That doesn't mean, though, that every MECFS patient has a large amount of this. Some of them have uh, similar amounts as the controls. But overall, the, the, uh, the level is higher. And the same is true for uh, this uh, SCD14 and the LPS. Again, the controls amount is lower than MECFS. The controls are lower than the MECFS, indicating some degree of inflammation in this population of patients. This data implies ongoing damage to the gut that's causing this increased microbial uh, translocation because of the findings of the significantly raised level of the plasma lipopolysaccharide and the le higher levels of the CD14 and the LBP. There are other diseases in which elevated LPS has been reported uh, the liver disease, HIV infection, chronic, Crohn's disease, and ulcerative colitis. So we went from there to look at the bacterial microbiomes. So uh, the, this is a diagram of how the bacterial microbiomes were analyzed. When people visited Susan Levine's uh, office, they were given a kit that they could take home to collect the sample, and those samples were then shipped to us in uh, Ithaca, New York. Uh, for processing. DNA was prepared, and then uh, we examined specifically the ribosomal uh, RNA uh, sequences uh, present, uh, and then used uh, next generation sequencing to get 98,000 sequences on average per sample uh, from each of these subjects to see what was in their gut microbiome, their bacterial gut, gut microbiome. What can uh, 16S DNA sequencing do? It can usually reveal the family and sometimes the genus and species of bacteria that are present. Uh, this, is, uh, this shows how we classify different, uh, different uh, uh, organisms using the example of the fox uh, as, as the species down here. If you have trouble uh, remembering domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, and order, this is a mnemonic that we use to help our, uh, our children remember this. So, uh, so I mentioned that we can see, that we can, we'll know whether we have a member of a family, um, sometimes genus and sometimes species. This is the dog family here. So sometimes we know we have dogs, but we do not know what, whether we have dogs or foxes. And when we have the genus, we might have an English fox or we might have an, an African fox. So, so if you're at the genus level, you can have considerable difference still. And then if you're down at the species level, then you might know if you have an English fox or not. Uh, and, but you may not know what kind of uh, variety of English fox, maybe one with red fur and one with uh, orange fur. So 
I'm making this point because some types of bacteria that actually belong to different species can't be distinguished by this rDNA sequencing. And so what people do who do microbiome analysis using ribosomal DNA sequencing is that they cluster the sequences together by what's called an operational taxonomic, taxonomic unit. And if the, if the sequence is 97% similar, then it's called to be this one unit, even though it may sometimes represent different species. And I just want to give you an example. So here's, here's three people. This pink person has a lot more of this uh, OTUA uh, than the blue person or the green person who doesn't have any. Uh, this, this OTUB, this person doesn't have much, this person has a lot more. And C, this person doesn't have either of, uh, th these two people don't have either of this C, but this person, this green person has a lot of it. You can use this information to do, do a mathematical transformation called a principal component analysis that can be displayed visually to indicate how similar two genomes are. So this, this, uh, from this kind of data, you, you, can, you can imagine this green dot as being all of the bacterial diversity present. The green is similar to the blue and more similar to the pink by using a lot of, of this type of data. Thousands of OTUs are identified typically. So you know that these two microbiota are, are cl more closely related than that one. Now, it, what's interesting is that you can actually separate animals with different types of diets ba based on this kind of analysis. So that uh, omnivores are up here, uh, herbivores in general are here, and carnivores are here. Their microbiomes are you know, different be because of their different diet. Now, pandas and bears don't fit too well. They're all mixed together right here, and it turns out that happens to be a result of a, an interesting structure of the gut in, in pandas and bears. But for a lot of species, this, is, this holds up pretty well. And this is, one, again, one of uh, Ruth Lay's uh, important results from her postdoc period. So we did the same kind of analysis with MECFS patients and controls, and what we found looking at the principal component of presence or absence uh, we could not separate the, the patients and controls doing this uh, in our po study population. We also looked at relative abundance, and we couldn't separate our patients and controls very well there either using this particular type of analysis. This may seem discouraging, but actually it's not totally unexpected. You can't, in fact, you can't, in fact, even separate uh, patients and controls this way who have Crohn's disease. This is a very large study, and they were really unable to separate the patients and controls uh, in this pediatric Crohn's disease using this method. So you need other methods to look for differences between uh, two, two cohorts. So one thing that we did do is we looked at the bacterial diversity in the patient group uh, compared to the healthy group. So this is how, this is the number of species or OTUs that you find, and this is as you keep sequencing and sequencing and sequencing until finally you have, in this case, 30,000 sequences. What we could see is that if you only sequence a little bit, it looks like the patients and controls are the same, but as you keep getting more and more sequences, you can find that the controls have a greater bacterial diversity than the uh, uh, CFS patients. So there's a loss of species richness in the MECFS microbiomes, and this has also been found in Crohn's disease and ulcerative uh, colitis. Uh, we can also look individually at all of the uh, species at the, uh, uh, at the family level. What this is, actually, is each one of these bars is somebody's microbiome diagrammed as to what, which ones of these uh, different uh, families they contain. And... Uh, we can see from this kind of analysis that members of, this, this, of these two families are significantly lower in the MECFS uh, patients than in the controls. And looking even more closely, we were able to find 24 families in genera that are differentially abundant between the patients and the healthy individuals. So these are more, more abundant in the controls. These are more abundant in the patients. One interesting fact is that members of this particular family, the ruminococci, were significantly higher in healthy individuals than in the patients. And some members of this family are known to produce anti-inflammatory proteins and butyrate, which you heard about in the last talk, which is an anti-inflammatory fatty acid. 
Lower levels of these butyrate producing bacteria and butyrate are also seen in Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Now I knew that people were going to ask this question so I put it up here and the fact is that we don't know whether existing probiotics can improve the gut microbiome. It is true that you can buy some, uh, some probiotics that have this particular genus in it, but there's not good evidence that would really actually help uh, people with MECFS. Uh, a decrease in this is also seen in these other diseases. There is one report of reduction in inflammatory cytokine levels after taking this particular species as a probiotic, but uh, whether that really improved uh, uh, their condition uh, significantly is, is, was not reported. So there's not a, uh, there, this is something that should be investigated, but it really is not known. Uh, clinical trials would be needed before you could de recommend any sort of probiotic for people with MECFS. Now we did use this data to see if we could develop a computational method for analyzing uh, and identifying people with MECFS versus controls. So in our population, we have 55% patients, 45% healthy. If we use a computational method combining the blood markers and the bacterial data, we can find that we can identify 53% of the 58% of patients present. We can identify correctly 30% of the uh, controls. So these people were then correctly diagnosed by our current microbiome inflammation test. Uh, this means that we're better at correctly identifying the patients and correctly identifying controls at this point with just these, these particular markers that we have now. If we, if we look at how good this kind of test is considered using something uh, called a rock curve that I won't go into, we, uh, it's, it's, it's considered good to excellent I'd like to see excellent. I'd like us to have an excellent test, but at least we're on our way to uh, identify some useful markers. But there, I want to emphasize the limitations of this kind of analysis. This data is inadequate to reveal whether there might be a particular bacterial strain differentially parent and parent, uh, present in the patients versus the healthy individuals. For example, many of you have heard about bad E. coli. We wouldn't have, no, from our type of analysis, we wouldn't know if all the patients had the bad E. coli instead of the good E. coli. This is, this is how it's often uh, you, uh, done. You actually do culturing or you sequence uh, other genes, not the ribosomal DNA genes, in order to find out whether you have bad E. coli or not. So we can't, show, we can't really say there's no very bad bacteria in the patients versus the controls. We can only look at the differences uh, in, the, in the OTUs. The bacterial microbiome studies also don't reveal what eukaryotic pathogens or beneficial species might be present, yeast, parasites, for example, and we do have a, someone in the lab analyzing some data on the same samples to, to find out what the eukaryotic uh, microbiome may be like. And finally, our data doesn't indicate whether viruses are differentially present. And uh, in a collaboration with uh, the group at Norwich, we are uh, looking at uh, the, the virome in these patients as well. So to conclude quickly, uh, we, I've shown you that there's less bacterial diversity in patients compared to the healthy population. There's association of abundance of specific groups with MECFS are healthy. 83% of the samples could be correctly classified. And we know that anti-inflammatory bacterial species are reduced in the patients. And I'm just going to quickly uh, give you a, a little snapshot of the future. Um, but one thing I did want to say first is that I don't see how these disturbances in the blood inflammatory markers and the gut microbiome could be possibly be explained by the psychosocial theories of MECFS. <laughs> So I just wanted to say uh, a future thing that we are interested in is to use metabolites as bi biomarkers. We did a, a very uh, preliminary pilot study uh, funded by some internal funds with a small group of controls and patients by my colleague Jason Locasal and my, my postdoc Arno Germain. Uh, this, uh, what we did is we isolated the polar metabolites uh, and then ran mass spectrometry. We got 361 metabolites. 12,000 data points, we analyzed this data. We found that there were 33 significantly different metabolites that were uh, at, 
And if you look, uh, the blue is the, the patients, the red is uh, the controls. The, in general, the, the patients had less of, of most of these metabolites in the controls. But what's extremely promising is that when we applied that same type of computational method to this data, we were actually able to distinguish 100% of the patients from the controls. This is a very small study, but hopefully with larger uh, data, with larger uh, sample size, uh, we will, I would like to uh, think that we, with m doing metabolite analysis, uh, we will be able to develop a, a real biomarker test for MECFS. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. We've got time for some questions, so please fire off. One of the um, clinical problems which are uh, present sometimes in patients who I think have got ME is that um, they come in clutching a piece of paper which tells them that they've got Lyme disease. And um, my assumption here is that uh, they've been to a lab where their Lyme antibodies are certainly present, but these Lyme antibodies are simply cross-reactive and not actually uh, reacting with a, the true infection. Um, what would your comment on that be? Really, I, I couldn't uh, comment on that because uh, we, we didn't, for example, test our samples for Lyme to find out whether there were you know, any, any um, uh, indications. Although I will say that if someone came to Susan Levine's office and said, I'm positive for Lyme, they wouldn't be part of our study. Uh, but uh, I, there is still a lot of controversy over the Lyme disease diagnostic tests. I think perhaps I can add that uh, it is a quite a big problem uh, in this country in that people mm -hmm. get this test done. They're told mm -hmm. they've got Lyme disease, but my understanding of the, uh, the immunological uh, reaction to any infection is the response is polyclonal, and some mm -hmm. of those uh, antibodies will inevitably cross-react with Lyme antigens, which then gives you a false positive test. And that these unfortunate people will then go off to some uh, place and have very considerable amounts of, uh, of uh, antibiotic to no, to no good effect, and uh, they then get disillusioned with the medical profession, which is not surprising. How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you in surgery. Yeah. Uh, Professor Hansen, an excellent presentation. Um, I was very interested, some of your patients in the series had quite a low BMI, down to 16, I think. Yeah. Um, did you have any correlation, or did you see any correlation between inflammatory markers and bacterial diversity and BMI or gastrointestinal symptoms in the patients that you surveyed? We, we did actually do a computational analysis to see if we could uh, correlate with anything else besides uh, patient or uh, control status. Uh, we, we did look at age and BMI and, and some other features of their survey forms and, didn't, and we're not able to make a, a correlation, but our sample size is fairly small. And uh, I, again, this was a pilot study, a two-year pilot study funded by NIH, and what we really need is a larger uh, sample, you know, cohort in order to make those kinds of correlations, which may very well exist. Okay. Well, Maureen, thank you very, very much indeed for that. First Nation, cheers.